And it is five o'clock. Um, we do have a quorum, but we are looking for a few more staff members as well as commission members. So we'll wait one minute before we get started. Just hanging on here, um, there's Patrick, and I guess Andrew will be joining us as well. Um, I'll go ahead and get started with the script. Um, so good evening, everyone. This is the January 23rd meeting of the Nantucket Planning and Economic Development Commission. Uh, we are convening by a video conference pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 is extended on July 16th, 2022. This meeting is being recorded and all attendees are participating remotely via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Um, anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please silence all phones and devices. Members of the public wishing to participate in the meeting must use their full name for Zoom access. If full names are not used, people will not be allowed to participate in the discussion. The town reserves the right to remove any member of the public from the meeting who doesn't use a full name or who acts inappropriately. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For items with public comment, uh, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. If you're not able to participate in the remote meeting, you may also submit comments to Megan Trudell, uh, mtrudell at nantucket-ma.gov. Um, confirming member access, I'm Mary Longacre, Chair of the Nantucket Planning and Economic Development Commission. Permit me to confirm all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Seth Engelborg? Here. Christy Ferrantella? Here. John Holgate? Here. Dave Iverson? Here. Kurt Johnson? Here. Matt Lowell? Here. Barry Rector? Here. John Trudell? Here. Uh, Joe Topham did say he was unable to make the meeting. And I do not see Wendy Hudson yet, so she may join. Um, Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Andrew Vorse. Present. Leslie Snell. Here. Megan Trudell. Here. Patrick Reed. Here. And from Mass DO2, uh, Risa Kwame. Here. And we have an anticipated speaker, Chantal Boyce Murphy. Um, good evening, Chantal. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. So turning to the agenda, uh, do we have, uh, we do have one change to the agenda. The minutes of December 19th are not available, so we will not be discussing them at this meeting. Uh, any other comments or changes, suggestions for the agenda before we take a motion to approve? Motion to approve the minutes is submitted, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Second. I got a second from Bert, thank you. Roll call vote, Seth Engelborg. Aye. Christy Parentella. Aye. Don Holgate. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Bert Johnson. Aye. Matt Lowell. Aye. Barry Rector. Aye. John Trudell. Aye. And I'll note that uh, Wendy Hudson is just joining us. Uh, Wendy, if you want to say aye to approve the agenda, you can have your vote recorded. Um, aye. Thank, Thank you. you okay, um, so public comments. Are there any members of the public present who wish to offer a comment at this time? You have some members, Megan, let me know if anyone has their hand up. I am not seeing anyone with their hand raised. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so moving on to the minutes of December 12th, uh, do we have any suggestions for um, changes to the minutes or a motion to adopt? Motion to approve is submitted. Thank second. you, Barry. Uh, I think that was Bert for the second again. Thank you. A roll call vote, Seth Engelborg. Aye. Mr. Grantella. Aye. John Holgate. Aye. 
Wendy Hudson. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Kurt Johnson. Aye. Matt Lowell. Aye. Gary Rector. Aye. And John Trudell. Aye. Thank you all. Uh, next item on the agenda is a presentation from Chantal Boyce Murphy, who is the director of the Culture and Tourism Department of the town. Chantal, um, tell us how we did in 2022 and what might be up for 2023 and anything else that's on your mind. Thank you. Um, 2022 was, as to be expected, a busy year on Nantucket uh, for the Culture and Tourism Department. I joined the department in June of 2022, so I'm approaching um, my eighth month in a week or so um, with the department, um, and it's been eventful to say the least. Um, this past year, we faced a lot of issues from uh, the most recent stranded passengers to um, uh, just general visitor uh, behavior on the island and things um, that we'd like to focus on um, for this uh, for this coming year and going forward um, regarding uh, those issues. I, I'll go into them a little bit more, but some of the projects uh, looking ahead that we're working on as a, as a department are, um, our building repairs, as well as updates on the on the restrooms, the public restrooms throughout the town, particularly the ones attached to the visitor services office at 25 Federal Street, and also looking at the Sconset Comfort Stations out there with uh, year-round um, NERDA services out there. Uh, we're getting a lot more visitors year-round interested in going out to Sconset, um, whether it be to just see the the village and walk around or do the bluff walk. And I think it would be really nice to focus on getting the comfort station winterized so that it can be open and available um, to both visitors and residents in that area. So that's one of the things that we've been we've been looking at. I'm really excited that um, town admin has been working diligently on that project, as well as the um, Parks and Recreation and DPW um, has been in, invested in that as well. Um, and I think we'll see some some improvements um, throughout this this year. And speaking of Sconset, one of the other focuses is a project for outdoor water bottle filling stations that was started um, with the plastic ban. There are about six stations that were purchased uh, by Rumi. Four were installed throughout the town, but two uh, still are still housed at the Wana Comet, um, housed by Wana Comet. We will be having those installed this year before the season starts. Uh, one at Children's Beach, and the other was supposed to go to the Harbor Master building, um, but we know that that building is um, being removed. So we're actually looking at, um, based on a request from the Sconset Civic League, having one installed out in Sconset. Um, they were interested in having one put in at the, um, at the park by the market. I know that that's owned by a conservation foundation, so I need to start or continue a conversation with them um, regarding that installation. So it'd be really nice to see um, just some basic improvements um, out in the village. Um, Sconset is very near and dear to me. I lived out there for a few uh, few winters. I think all of us Nant Nantucketers in the Nantucket shuffle have probably had had a little cottage in Sconset at some point. <laughs> um, and then another big project of ours for this year is tracking visitor and resident um, data. We have access to not just the, uh, the census, but also the Nantucket data platform, but we all know that that information can be a bit delayed. We've been fortunate uh, with a partnership with the airport to have found um, a, a platform that housed that information, which essentially tracks cell phone data. So a lot of the apps that you download on your phone, um, I know none of us ever read the fine print, I'm guilty of it as well. And when it says that they share your data, they really do share your data. So we find a platform that is um, a little less invasive, but um, tracks cell phone data and will be able to inform us on um, visitor traffic to the island. So basic information, where are they coming from? How are they getting here? Once they're here, where are they staying? What are they doing? Where are they eating, shopping? Um, you know, what, what are they taking advantage of? Theater, movie, um, concerts, the likes. And it also on those busy weekends where we all guesstimate how many people are on the island, we'll actually be able to say, you know, there really were 50,000 people at um, Jetty's Beach for, for Pops this year. Um, I'm really excited about that. That's something that we're looking at for the start of this fiscal year. And I had a great meeting with the platform this morning as well just to follow up on um, our contract conversation. One of the reasons I'm, outside of being a data nerd, <laughs> one of the reasons I'm really excited about that is because it 
will help us compare the data for um, our data to similar locations, whether it be uh, other seasonal towns, uh, nearby islands, or um, just, just um, other towns with similar demographics so that we can see what's happening there. Um, and also it'll help us help inform um, how we staff, what infrastructure needs there are on the island, and then also measure the success of whatever initiatives or policies that we've rolled out. Um, one of the really cool features of this, uh, this platform is that it gives us information going back, um, I believe it goes back about um, seven years. So we'll be able to see information from 2016, not just once we sign the contract and we gain access to the data, uh, we'll be, be able to actually backtrack and, and get access to that information. And the most exciting part is that it's only delayed 72 hours. So we'll actually be able to say on Friday night, there were, you know, a thousand people that took the, took the steamship over to the island from Hyannis, or we had um, 250 people flew in through LaGuardia to the island on a given Saturday in, let's say, August. Um, and then it'll also help us, um, it'll also create opportunities to partner with private sectors um, via marketing efforts. Um, so that we can attract the right people and right businesses to the island to really be able to, um, to, to um, I think, help call some of the behaviors that we see, we see on the island in the summer. Um, so that's one of the projects that's rolling out. And then finally, the one that uh, is most pressing is the Stranded Passengers Protocol. Um, we've been working really hard on that um, since for about a year now, the department has been working on it, particularly with the Visitor Services Advisory Committee. And um, Liz Holland has been spearheading that. She's also a member of the of um, BSAP. And I got involved in last summer when I joined the department, but particularly after the summer in about September. Interestingly enough, we had a meeting of um, the Stranded Passengers Group scheduled for the Tuesday after um, stroll. And then of course, everything happened on Saturday. Um, so we were already in conversations about it. One of the things we already have figured out is um, essentially the, the um, temporary shelter where people will be housed in the event that this protocol is initiated. We also have transportation sorted out and then most importantly, a communication plan for how the town will best communicate with the transportation um, agencies, how we'll communicate with passengers or visitors to the island during those busy um, festival weekends when we know that we have limited uh, accommodations, and there's a potential for weather, so, um, mainly focusing on Daffodil Festival and Christmas Stroll Weekend, because we see heavy um, day trip traffic during those weekends. Um, but one part that we're really struggling with is figuring out the legalities behind um, housing 250 to 300 people at a private location um, and making sure that everyone is um, safe that all the volunteers are protected and we have essentially have all of our ducks in a row. Um, and then also where, what are they gonna sleep in? <laughs> um, pots don't fall from the sky and money doesn't grow on trees. <laughs> One of the things I've been hearing a lot <laughs> throughout this whole process. So really have to, um, is, is, it, is it that we're buying 250 cots and where's that money coming from? Are we just offering them sleeping, um, sleeping bags? Mr. Rector has been very kind, um, guiding us along along the way. And uh, he's, he's a term that um, I'm probably gonna butcher, but something he said in our last meeting that I keep replaying in my head is that um, it's not, we're not offering them a hotel stay. They're looking for somewhere um, out of the elements to spend the night um, if need be until they can get off of the island. So this isn't, a, I was calling it a, a comfort station. It's, it's probably not gonna be comfortable, but it's gonna be safe at the very least. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's been um, a major focus of ours in the last um, month and a half or so. So I, that's, I said I would keep it within 20 minutes. I think I did a really good job doing that. So that's really my updates uh, for what the department is working on some high level things. We have some, some smaller agenda items coming down the pipeline that I don't think I'm in a good enough position to speak on yet because I do have to um, keep checking off my boxes. Until um, so I can speak on them publicly. But in the meantime, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. And thank you for having me.
Thank you, Shanta. The, the news about uh, potentially having the restrooms open year round in Sconset, that's huge news. Yeah. I know many, many people will be grateful when that happens. Um, mm -hmm. Barry, thank you to you for arranging to have Shanta, Shanta here tonight. Um, did you have any uh, questions that you received from commissioners that you wanted to uh, offer mm -hmm. this time? Madam Chair, what I, what I might ask is just really two things. One, so Shanta, I was I was pretty blunt when I <laughs> when I gave you that phrase, but truly, when it comes when it comes to trying to do sheltering, um, as you said, it really isn't a hotel; it's more of a life raft that we're offering, um, and you know, it's it it is basic essentials, but it's getting people out of the elements. And just making sure that their basic needs are being met. Um, so you, I love you for using that quote. Uh, thank you. Um, I think while well, I've got you here, and boy, that that doesn't mean I need an answer today. But did uh, one thing we talked about was were there any opportunities that you saw for collaboration between your department and the NP and EDC, both both on you know on a local but more importantly on a regional basis as well too because that's that's kind of what we're here for so i don't want to put you i don't want to feel like i'm putting you on the spot um and if that can best be answered by maybe a a, a letter or an email later that's cool um but i just wanted to kind of throw that back out to you i definitely can think of something <laughs> Um, that I need help with. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm always the person raising my hand being like, help, I'm, I'm not afraid to ask for help. Um, but I, I, I did reach out to another department to get some inf more information. So I, I want to make sure that when I'm asking for help, I'm going to the right place. So um, stay tuned on that. It'll likely come in the form of a letter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Um, questions from commissioners for Chantal. Bert? Yeah, you know, where are you planning on uh, putting these people up on the cots? One of the schools? No, the Westmore Club was kind enough to offer their um, their spa gym area. Um, they have that large space, so we're very grateful for them for that. Yeah, I was going to ask you that, but I didn't want to ask Chanta. So thank you for saying it because. I remember when Liz talked to me about this early on, I can't even remember what incident happened. It wasn't this year. This was a, this was a well, little while ago. And that whole thing with Westmore kind of popped into my head. And they have the heat, you know, that's a year round up there. There's not a lot going on in that gym. And just to, as Barry said, just a life raft, a place to put your head down, it's warm, the showers and brush your teeth and, get to the boat in the morning. I mean, it's really not, this isn't like a, oh God, like a, you know, something where you have a, an emergency that everybody knows is coming. This, this is different. This is, a, you know, a hundred people. It could be 200. It, it depends. And better communication. Everything you said is right on the money. And, and um, um, Liz does a good job and, it's very hard to communicate between who's canceling and who isn't. Sometimes the fat, the slow boat that you don't find out about it until it's too late, you know? So I just want to also echo this concert restroom thing. That's awesome. Now that's a slab on grade building. So it shouldn't be that hard to keep it from freezing. I believe it's a slab on grade. So Whatever has to be done out there shouldn't be too bad to keep that on in the winter. So that's a great idea. And it's been, that's been, that's a good, that's good for us. Good for Nantucket to do that. So thank you very much for everything you're doing. Thank you, Nat. Other commissioners? Okay, seeing no hands. Uh, Shanta, thank you again for appearing and uh, looking forward to great things next year. Um, hopefully another good year for Nantucket, whatever that turns out to mean. And Thank congratulations you, on your appointment. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shanta. All right, next item on the agenda is an update from our transportation program manager, Patrick, take it away. 
Thanks, everybody. Megan, I'm going to go ahead and share here. Uh, this is a image heavy document. So I'm going to just share out of a PDF just to keep it clean and hopefully it won't crash on me. Um, oh, let's see if it's already doing that. All right, we'll have to do it this way, I guess. Um, so a quick overview. Um, the first item here today is to talk about uh, 3C data update. So as you know, there are a number of different documents that we take care of from a regional perspective with MassDOT to just um, keep our 3C program viable. Um, these typically are the Long Range Transportation Plan, Transportation Improvement Program, and Unified Planning Work Program. Additionally, we also submit a Title VI document each year, and this, and this um, cycle, we've been asked to do a comprehensive plan for Title VI, which is basically documenting our non-discrimination practices, procedures, and reporting. Um, <clears throat> but each of these documents includes um, similar data tables, uh, maps, things like that, that I thought it would be helpful to go through with you all. Um, so first, we'll go through demographics and equity. Uh, you can see here um, at the overall population, 29% um, of Nantucket is reporting in the latest DC annual census is non-white, which is pretty significant. And in the spatial clustering of that, you can see in the blue dots on the dot density map here that there's a lot of clustering in south of town and the mid-island area. Um, and so the, the way maybe I should make a comment about these maps, because you'll see several, several of these dot density maps. The way this works is that there are a number of different census blocks. Um, we constrain those census blocks by the location of where actual structures are. And so the um, spatial distribution is, is spread evenly across the location of structures. What that does is it gives you a better spatial depiction of clustering, um, but it doesn't actually reflect the actual location of someone's residence. So just to be clear for privacy purposes, um, but you get a good sense at the high level of where there's different clustering um, happening. So you can see here, um, there's significant clustering for folks who are reporting as non-white in the south of town and, and mid-island area. And from an income perspective, um, there's a relative degree of income diversity across town. You can see the blue dots on the map are sort of clusterings of higher income areas. And then where you see the goldish, yellowish dots, that's lower middle income areas. Um, and then finally, anything in red, those are households that are reporting incomes that are significantly lower. Uh, it's sort of hard to see that on the map. So what I did is I looked at the HUD um, definition of media, median family income. Um, and you can see that for Nantucket in um, FY21, it's $122,800. 50% of that is $61,400. So if you look at a spatial depiction on the map that focuses on just those that are making approximately 50% of median family income, you can see that clustering uh, effect more pronounced. This is uh, not just characteristic of where people are choosing to locate, but also characteristic of where the density actually is on the island, right? Um, so that's why you see that clustering there in, in that particular area. Um, in terms of language, um, uh, generally speaking, uh, the census data, which is American Community Survey data, they haven't released the DC annual census data yet for language, um, but most families in, in uh, Nantucket are reporting as English proficient. There's only several that are not uh, reporting as English proficient, and those are shown here on this map. In yellow, you see sort of a distribution of uh, Spanish-speaking households that are not English proficient, and then in red, a distribution of other Indo-European language-speaking um, households. That's a, a larger group of, of different languages, and then four, um, some Asian and Pacific languages. Interestingly, these are all relegated to the same census block group, so you can see those uh, behind sort of the squares here. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that the way this maps in the dot density map, it, it evenly distributes these households across that entire area, it could be the case that these are more consolidated and confined. And so additional field work could really bear out that distinction. And in order to kind of get it at a little bit further, uh, I, I thought it might be helpful to kind of talk about some of MassDOT's work. Their Office of Transportation Planning has a, done a great job um, looking at sort of um, a regional environmental justice plus communities. So this is building off the concept that you're probably familiar with 
which is uh, environmental justice communities. And what this does is it looks at communities that are impacted by transportation, uh, that might be impacted the most by transportation changes. Um, and there's a couple of different statistical criteria that they use. So um, at least one of the three EJ uh, criteria for these different census blocks must be true. Um, that first, those first three there are that the AM, our annual median household income has to be equal in or greater, uh, equal or equal to or less than the MPO's 25th percent. Uh, the percentage of minority has to be greater than or equal to the 75th percentile of the uh, MPO, and the uh, percent of households with uh, limited English proficiency or LEPs um, has to be greater than or equal to the 75th percentile. And so this is all relative to the island, not necessarily the state at large or the larger nation, which, which is good. It kind of helps you get a better understanding of what the needs are within your own community rather than compared to a larger um, community group. Um, there's an additional criteria. Um, it says that at least one of the following transportation criteria must be true. Uh, households with no uh, vehicles um, has to be greater than or equal to the 75th percentile of the region. Households with disabilities has to be equal than or greater to the 75th percentile of the region. And same with seniors. So you can see the breakdown here for Nantucket as compared to the other regions. And you can see here on a map some of their draft work. They just updated this map today. Um, so I have draft labeled here because I'm sure it's a work in progress. Uh, but they show you some of the locations where they're um, considering um, status for EJ plus communities um, based on particular criteria. And so where you think about that language um, uh, situation again, where predominantly all those Spanish speaking households that did not have um, English proficiency were in where you see that purple area or pinkish area on the map. That's for MASTA that's showing uh, the most dominant factor there is zero uh, vehicle households as being a, a reason why they would consider this a, um, a regional uh, environmental justice plus community. But the thing to kind of keep in mind is it's not the whole area. It's likely the case that these folks are clustered towards uh, closer in towards the center of town. It's just not likely that someone without a vehicle would be living further away uh, from uh, the town. So a couple of big demographic and equity takeaways, as I mentioned before, 29% of Nantucket's population reports mixed or non-white racial status, which is a pretty large number. Um, uh, spatial analysis suggests that similar clustering patterns for non-white and moderate lower income populations exist, uh, particularly in mid-island and south of town areas. And then a very limited number of populations do not speak English very well on the island. Um, but those that do not tend to speak English very well cluster uh, by language category. Um, and so I think additional field work would be helpful to further draw out spatial patterns for language and transportation needs for, for those communities um, and to get a better sense of where they actually reside within the census blocks, which are relatively large. Moving on to safety. Um, what you see here on yeah. I, I think it's really important that you provided the context for some of those maps, um, saying things like the clusters are not just because of the factors that being mapped, but also because of how the general population is distributed on the island. And, you know, explaining how the, the dots don't represent locations, they represent an equal distribution across the entire block. Those are really important things to understand as we look at these maps. So thank you for bringing those out. No problem. Uh, moving on to safety. Um, a couple of different things to keep in mind here as we go through these maps. These are based on crash records that are reported by the town and state police. Um, they're aggregated by MassDOT into an impact, uh, what they call is their impact database. Um, and the town basically um, is the able to kind of use their data to go ahead and spatially map. And MassDOT's done some spatial mapping on their own. In this particular case, I've taken 20 years of uh, crash data here to, to kind of give you some uh, senses of where things are happening uh, in town and in the region. Um, there are 3,415 crash records that are um, basically mapped uh, or that are uh, potentially a, able to be looked at to be mapped. We're uh, automatically geocoded um, ones were 2,984. I had to manually locate 215 and I could not locate uh, a remaining 216. So that means 216 crash records are out there and it's it's just difficult to um, 
figure out what or what, why was happening. And I think that kind of gets the um, need to kind of think about um, consistency and reporting and the need to make sure that we do uh, report all the locations. Cause I think this stuff is helpful for um, future investment purposes, thinking about where you might want to do police patrol, things like that. Um, so the yellow boundary on this map here, it shows a statistically significant spatial dispersion of all crashes over 20 years. Um, this shows you where the frequency of crashes is crashes are more likely to be a pattern rather than random. Um, but this is relative to the spatial average of all crashes on the island. So that means that you'll see things beyond that sort of yellow boundary, right, that have this gradient purple color. That means that crashes did occur in those other locations. It's just less likely that those are related to some kind of pattern rather than being, uh, uh, and more so being normal, right? Um, so the crashes that fall within the yellow boundary, you can think of the pattern most likely being related to higher volumes, higher frequency of people, just more people there. Um, the darker gradient suggests that there's a higher number of crashes relative to the spatial average and lighter means that there's less. But again, um, anytime you see like a block on the on the map here, it shows you that there are a series of, of crash records located in that particular area. If there's an area that's empty, that means we don't have any crash records that we're able to geolo geolocate on a roadway in that particular area. So what you can do is you can drill down into the data um, to get significant characteristics of interest um, and to look at those and see where they fall. Um, this is a map that shows you where statistically significant um, injuries and fatalities are 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 located and have a higher probability of not being random, right? And again, that's related to that idea that there's just more people here. So the pattern that's really being picked up is higher volumes, more people. It doesn't necessarily mean that the um, uh, low areas outside of the yellow are not important. It just means that the spatial pattern isn't really there and they're more likely to be random. So crashes resulting in injuries, um, there's sort of a, a number of different categories and I've aggregated them up to make them a little bit more comprehensible, but 2% of any crash uh, resulting in an injury was actually a fatality, right? For the town of Nantucket out of those 3,400 some records. 11% uh, resulted in incapacitating or severe injuries and 87% were non-capacitating or minor injuries. Um, this- Excuse me again. Yes. So you said this was 20 years of data, roughly 3,500 crashes. So that's 70 fatalities from car crashes? Seven fatalities. Seven, so, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm check my math there. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> the, these are only, the graph that you see here is only relevant to the crashes from that set of 3,000 some. It's a mm -hmm. subset that have resulted in injury or fatality. So of those crashes that have some kind of outcome that involves an injury, 2% of those were fatalities. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a relatively high number. Um, it's important to kind of just keep that in context um, just because I think when you, you hear seven, it doesn't sound like a lot over 20 years, but from a percentage standpoint, it's pretty high for a fatality rate. Um, so moving on here, all documented vehicle actions um, uh, for crashes resulting in injuries and fatalities. Again, this is a subset of any all the crashes. It's just the ones that have resulted in injuries and fatalities. Um, most of the vehicles or the greatest number of vehicles um, have been documented uh, traveling straight ahead for these types of crashes. Um, but you'll also see significant numbers of actions involved in these injury resulting crashes, um, including turns, left turns, right turns, which is pretty common. Left turns often tend to be higher um, uh, result, a uh, higher number of movements that, that uh, result in injury. And then you see a number here of, of um, cars that were either slowing, stopping traffic or parked that were also involved in these injury resulting crashes. Um, traveling straight ahead is sort of a concern it. Um, that means typically um, you see these sorts of things happen when higher speeds are involved. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as you move forward. Um, these are harmful events associated with crashes. So 60% of these uh, crashes that result in injury or fatality have to do with motor vehicle versus motor vehicle or multiple motor vehicles. Um, nine per, uh, almost 10% involve a cyclist. Uh, about 5% involve a tree, um, and then about 4% are 
uh, have a parked motor vehicle and about uh, just two and a half percent um, with a pedestrian. So another thing to kind of reinforce here is that the data is only good as the reporting. Um, there are a couple of different cases where I was familiar with the crash events and I saw it reported a little bit differently in the file. But at the macro level, this gives you a little bit of a, a, a good picture of, of macro trends, right? So trying to glean any any sort of relationship between time, season, uh, with sort of the next step here, obviously you can expect a higher frequency of crashes when more people are on the island. So that peak season, uh, you see more crashes occurring in the peak season, particularly in August. Um, there wasn't really any kind of spatial trend, surprisingly. I, I kind of went into this assuming that you'd have more crashes on Saturdays, Sundays, maybe Thursdays and Fridays, things like that. But that doesn't necessarily seem to be totally borne out by the data. Um, and also rest assured, you can feel safe that if you're driving on a Monday in December, you're probably uh, you're probably doing okay and, and will be uh, arriving at your destination uh, safely. Um, so for the crashes that result in injuries, um, the next step was to look at time of day and crash severity. So on the y-axis here, uh, or the vertical axis, you have the time of day. Um, on the x-axis, you have the number of fatalities that were associated um, with a particular kind of result. So in the dark red, you can see um, some injuries. Uh, I'm sorry, in the darkest red, you can see some fatalities. Um, they are really occurring more so in the afternoons, right? One, two, three, four p.m. Um, it's sort of surprising when you see the next graph. You, uh, one might assume that many of these crashes are going to be happening later at night, um, but crashes that are resulting in injuries are actually sort of dispersed throughout the afternoon. You can see there's sort of an uptick around 11 a.m. and things are a little bit higher through the 6 p.m. time frame. And there's a spike again at, at you know midnight and 1 a.m. late night. But for the most part, um, not a lot of crashes happening in the early, early morning and, and the um, sort of the daybreak 7 a.m., 8 a.m. time frame. Uh, the next area to drill down is crashes involving non-motorists. You see a slightly more constrained statistical um, probable area where, where crashes are less likely to be random involving non-motorists. Again, this is uh, re likely a, a phenomenon related to um, just volumes and the number of people that are there. Um, but you can see over the map to other locations where there um, have been non-motorist crashes in those gradient blocks. Um, crashes that involve non-motorists, 22% uh, had some sort of pedestrian involved in the record, 75% had a cyclist, and then other 3%, those are people like skateboarders, people who are rollerblading, people who have a stroller, things like that. The injury severity of non-motorist crashes is important to look at. Um, there's a big gap here, right? You'll see in that gray block, 17% of uh, crashes with involving non-motorists result in a report where, you know, the injury severity is not known. This is not necessarily the fault of the person who is doing the record keeping because a lot of times the injury severity is not known as someone is transported off to the hospital and leaves the scene. Um, but it is important to kind of just call out here that there's a gap. Um, so 1% of these crashes with non-motorists resulted in a fatality. 7% uh, resulted in a severe injury or an incapacitating injury. 45% non-incapacitating. And then 30% of folks walked away. So those are likely the, the lower speed crashes. And then the last kind of chart that I'll show you here related to safety um, relates to uh, primary vehicles action um, in vehicle non-motorist crashes. So again, similar to, you know, all crashes resulting in injury, traveling straight ahead is a large, um, it's the largest um, sort of category here. Again, that suggests that there are higher speeds. So when you think about interventions you can do um, to kind of cut that down, it would be looking at speed management. Um, and similar to um, the, the other uh, chart as well, you'll see the trends here are um, very, very similar, turning right, turning left, entering traffic lanes, things like that. They tend to be a little bit higher. Um, the fatalities are from traveling straight ahead. So what you can do is if you were going to go ahead and think about where you want to focus investment or at least focus monitoring in the future, you could create what's called a high injury network. 
based on the statistical areas that we produced, these uh, these roadways that are shown on the map here are probably areas that you'd want to focus. Um, this uh, area or this sort of set of roadways includes all public roads located within or intersecting the high injury and non murderous focus areas that I showed you. It includes two fatality locations, um, one at Bartlett Farm Road and Surfside Road, one at Milestone Road and Pulpus Road, which we've talked about a little bit in the past. Um, it adds a segment of Milestone and Old South to nobody or farm based on crash frequency, and it excludes private roadways. So I took out anything within the area that was a private roadway because it's less likely that the town or region would invest in a private roadway. So for an example, Wind Street was in there. Um, it could be the case that maybe it considers an improvement or a taking in the future. And I think, I think there's been some work to, to consider that. Um, but for now, uh, it's not included in this list. A couple of things to consider. Um, this doesn't include um, major non-motorist corridors like Pulpus, Milestone, Madiket, Surfside, and how far they extend out. Could be the case that you want to extend a focus area to any roadway that includes a non-motorist path because those gradient blocks were shown on the map. There are records along those main corridors in and out of town. Uh, it's not a bad idea just to kind of think about those. Um, and then finally, there wasn't as much uh, in terms of crash frequency um, in the Richmond area as I expected, but then I realized I'm looking at a 20-year data set, right? So that's a newer development. So things that are sort of located in that area it could be over time um, for better, for, well, for worse, obviously, you could pick up more crashes there. Um, but in the case of monitoring and thinking about future investments, it could be the case that you want to um, include that in this uh, roadway set here. This does dovetail nicely with the town overlay district, right? Um, it's just um, another way of kind of showing that, you know, the highest frequency areas are places where it makes sense to focus investment um, because you have the most people there and the most people there who are getting into crashes that are um, at least statistically less likely to be random. Um, so a couple of different safety takeaways besides that. Crashes resulting in injury historically have occurred more frequently in the afternoon and evening as opposed to later at night. That was sort of a to me, um, but something that might be of interest. More frequently during uh, peak season, that, that goes without saying. Um, and there's generally an even distribution across peak season weekdays, which is a little bit surprising. Um, almost 13% of crashes resulting in an injury, severe injury or fatality involved a non-motorist. Um, and I think we all know that non-motorists do not account for 13% of transportation demand on the island. So it's worth thinking about uh, prioritizing investment for those users to make sure that they can travel a little bit more safely. Vehicles traveling straight ahead account for the greatest number of vehicle uh, non-motorist crashes resulting in injuries. And as I mentioned previously, often high speeds are linked to these types of crashes. And finally, left and right turns, as well as entering traffic are vehicle movements that have also resulted in higher injury rates and severe uh, with greater severity for non-motorists but also motorists as well so a couple uh, nuggets to think about as the town and region move forward this uh, last set of data updates is not produced by me it's produced by um, the metropolitan area planning council uh, with assistance from umass's donahue institute uh, for MassDOT. These are items that have to be included in the town's long range transportation plan. Um, and really what the purpose of including these projections is for is for the state's travel demand model. It's a four step model um, used to kind of simulate different scenarios related to transit planning, uh, things like that. Sometimes they're fed into more micro models to look at congestion, um, but also macro level trends. I'll, I'll just be very direct and tell you it's not that relevant to Nantucket um, as much as it would be to sort of more connected regions that um, are not so isolated. I mean, Nantucket's great. I mean, in, in the sense of transportation planning, it's its own animal, right? Uh, that being said, it's important to include these in the long range plan um, because it's a requirement. And so I think it's fair to, to share the um, uh, data with you here. Uh, before we go on, one one thing I wanted to mention that um, you know I, I always uh, think it's helpful to remind folks that projections are helpful tools. They're scenarios of potential futures, and they're based on trends, anticipated trends, or planned interventions. But they are not exact science representations of what is going to occur, the only decision-making tool, or proficient at accounting for things like seasonal variation, uh, which is another reason why it's not necessarily a relevant tool for you. 
that being said, uh, MAPC, which is another region that is contracting for MassDOT, produced the following. Um, there is a projected increase in households uh, residing on the island by 2050. I'll tell you at a percentage basis, uh, Nantucket is the fastest growing region. Uh, it's important to keep that in context, though, because we're the smallest, it's easiest to grow the fastest, right? Um, but you'll see we pick up, um, uh, it looks like about a, you know, just over a thousand or so. Um, households in um, uh, by 2050. Um, and household here is defined as either a family or a person who is residing by themselves. Um, it's really that idea of a unit, like a, that being a single person, a couple, a family. Residential unit gains. This is sourced from the mass builds database that uh, MAPC maintains. What they do is they scrape um, different sources from the state to see where development is happening. Most of the stuff that they scrape from Nantucket is actually based on Section 106, so historic reviews. Uh, they're able to see how many residential unit gains were anticipated to have on particular projects. Um, you can see there's a, pro uh, a projected residential unit gain by 2015. Um, that means that the residential unit to household ratio is actually going to decrease. Right now, for every two units that exist on Nan, uh, there's 2.2 units, I guess, for every household on Nantucket. Um, but important to keep in mind, some of these in the housing stock are not necessarily all your units. So another reason why it's important to have some context with these numbers. That is projected to decrease by 2050 with the new household gains. Um, they also did some employment modeling. I will be very direct and so tell you that I believe these are the result of um, macro level changes, um, the things that you see on the map here, but you'll see the lower um, uh, sort of portion of the chart here, which includes a number of different macro level sectors. Um, there is a, on, on the on the full, there's sort of a net gain, a very, very slight net gain. And then there's a loss projected for the leisure and hospitality, injury, uh, hospitality industry. Um, I believe that just has to do with following state trends at large, and then also retirements from um, the workforce that are anticipated with or aging out of the, the labor force. So protection takeaways, demand for permanent residents on the island will continue to increase through 2050 um, based on MAPC's um, work. Unit to household ratio decreases, meaning potentially greater competition and cost for housing. Um, employment losses between 2020 and 2030 are potentially attributable to macro level retirement trends. Minor employment growth following 2030 is potentially attributable to gain in permanent households, uh, but generally permanent island-based employment is anticipated to remain static. Um, overall, I think it was like a nominal change of 65 new jobs. Um, increase, there's also anticipated increased number of permanent households resulting in greater demand for the transportation network. So all of this is rel uh, relevant to the transportation network in that you have more people living here year round. It's pretty obvious you have more people demanding um, transportation, um, either services based on the roadway, things like that. Um, so those are the data updates that I wanted to walk through with you. I know it is a ton of information, but I think it's important and it will be included in the documents that you see moving forward. Um, happy to answer any questions that you have about them. So Patrick, thank you. That was quite a lot of information. I wonder, is that shared with other departments, uh, in particular the housing um, director, Tucker Holland, uh, or maybe Bert through your connections? I don't know that we got to um, get on. Um... So Patrick, you might want to reach out to Tucker with some of that information and uh, with the qualifications that, that you mentioned, I noticed that uh, logging and mining employment was anticipated to increase on Nantucket, and I thought that was unlikely. <laughs> um, John Trudeau, you have a question or a comment? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Patrick, I just wanted to, uh, for clarification, um, go back to the percentage of fatalities because it is significant. Um, uh, Mary brought up uh, the 2% of the 3,500, that is 70. So either it's 70 fatalities over the last 20 years based on the 3,500 crashes, or it's uh, it's um, uh, seven. So we just have to make that um, clarification or correction uh, because 2% of the 3,500 is 70. 
Yeah, I wondered, is, is it 350? Is it a smaller set of the crashes that we're looking at, Patrick? Yeah, let's clarify here. So there's seven fatalities total across the 300, uh, 3,415 in the data set. Not all of those are non-motorists. So it should be seven divided by 3,415. 0.002. Yeah. 0.2%. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I can believe the seven. I could not believe the 70. So yeah. Great. Right. Thank you for the clarification. I'll go back and check the numbers, just to make sure that they're all squared away here. Thank you. And thank you, John, for following up on that. Uh, other comments or questions from commissioners? All right, I don't see any. So Patrick, if you want to move on to your next topic, and thank you again. That must have been a lot of work, especially yeah, no, the presentation on it's definitely uh it's definitely important to get those charts together because I think I think they do help and and we do want to make sure that they're accurate uh, and then um, reporting and easy to understand in terms of like what's actually being reported. So I appreciate the comment from Mr. Trudell. Um, this next item is going through report or a status of ongoing projects. I'll try to keep this pretty brief. Um, the current projects that you see on the left-hand side of the screen here, Milestone Road and Pulpus Road Path and Intersection Improvement. Right now, a contractor GPI is working with MassDOT on permitting. So the good news is that this is moving through the permitting process. MassDOT is continuing to work through its intersection control evaluation process um, to figure out how they want to move this one forward. Um, I was talking to GPI earlier about this, and they said, you know, they don't think MassDOT's ready for us uh, in terms of um, coordinating directly with us because I think they want to have sort of a, a solidified understanding of, of their best approach. Um, but the commitments were made, the requests were made by the town and region. And I think I think that project is on a good path forward. Uh, the Pleasant Sparks Williams Nauta Motors Improvements Project. This is looking at new sidewalks on Pleasant Street, uh, as well as sidewalk expansions on that portion of Sparks between um, both the route, roundabout and the rotary, as well as the sidewalk on William Street. I'm happy to report that the town was successful in um, going after a $500,000 grant for this project, which was just awarded a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that's that's a real success. Um, looking forward to seeing that one move forward. Um, and that will live with the DPW. Um, the Wawinet Road side path project. Thanks for all who have contacted me on that particular project. This went to the select board recently to get a review um, of the memorandum of agreement with Federal Highway Administration's Eastern Federal Lands Highway Division, which will be managing the project. Uh, the memorandum of agreement spells out roles and responsibilities, as well as an anticipated timeline for their design of the project. Um, they will be managing the design of the project, but it will have to go through the National Environmental Policy Act documentation process. So th uh, that project built in a lot of um, opportunities for public input uh, and analysis. So as I mentioned previously, both a build and some uh, both build alternatives, plural, and a no build alternative will be looked at just to kind of understand environmental degradation, impact, and look at the best ways to kind of avoid different environmental assets. Um, that will uh, be moving forward with Federal Highway, as I mentioned. They have also not yet made a decision on the Federal Land Access Program's Cycle 22 grant request. Um, they are still working uh, to move through those. Um, so they're doing their best. I think uh, you can anticipate an update on that one soon. Tom Never Side Path, Andrew and I met with a contractor this morning on that particular project who is working on the 25% designs. Um, they have 90% of their base map and survey work done. So that's great. Um, what they'll be doing is they'll be overlaying the uh, path design from the feasibility analysis on the base map when it's done and, and start to move that project forward. I contacted VHB for an update on our request for estimate um, for the Orange Street non-motorist improvements project. This is that path that would span between uh, Goose Pond uh, Road and the Rotary um, on the north side of the roadway. Uh, the reason we've chosen VHB as, as sort of the first to get the first bite at the apple on this particular project is they've done work on, with us on Orange Street in the past. They are still in the process of preparing an estimate. Um, so uh, they told us they're diligently working away, but haven't gotten there yet. So we're waiting to hear back on that one. On the Surfside Area Water and Roadway Improvements Project, Contractor GPI 
Um, I'll, I'll focus more on the roadway side uh, just because the water side is sort of a, a different ballywick. Uh, but on the roadway side, GPI has been working on different um, traffic calming options uh, for staff review in town. And those the next time they bring that project to to the public, it will include those different traffic calming improvements. But this little preview, the idea is that they'll do a couple different table crossings. Uh, and they're also looking at these median islands um, to kind of slow traffic down as it moves through Lover's Lane, but also on Monahansett at that large curve. Um, the idea is that, you know, these are areas where you can pick up uh, pretty high speeds because they're straight shots or kind of larger radius curves. Um, so the idea the idea is it's, it's a good idea to slow people down and you can kind of see that based on the previous um, safety analysis that we put together. In terms of 3C transportation planning, I'm continuing to kind of get my monthly reports in order. Raisa right? will tell you that I'm a little bit behind. So we've had a ton going on. So the good news is um, that's all coming together. The Title VI comprehensive plan will be completed before my departure. Um, so that's good news as well. We'll have some long range transportation plan components. Um, everything that you saw earlier in the presentation will be inc included updated as necessary and included in the long range transportation plan um, components that I'll package together for the for the next um, transportation program manager or planner. And then I'll also be creating a trans transition document that kind of shows the, the status of each project where it's at, as well as an inventory of equipment. Uh, some of you will recall, we purchased some counting equipment um, using some excess 3C dollars that we had in our last budget. It's happy to hear Sean Todd talk about the um, uh, big data because I think some of that counter, uh, that counting equipment can be used to validate some of the volumes that, that we get through big data. And I'll, I'll be connecting probably folks in the strategic um, project team on the town side with Sean Todd to see if there's any synergy there in terms of looking at um, contracting uh, agreements for um, any counting that, that needs to be done in the future. That was a really great update by her. And I think that's good to hear that that's happening in town. Um, other initiatives to be aware of, the Safe Streets and Roads for All uh, grant application. We've been told that there's supposed to be a decision on it at the end of this month. Um, now that it's getting closer to the end of the month and we haven't heard anything yet, my sense is that maybe it might get be, it might be pushed to next month. Um, with my departure, this was a joint application between us, Martha's Vineyard, and FR Cog. Uh, Beth Giannini, Giannini, who works for FR Cog, will be the main point of contact on this one. And she'll be working with Andrew to kind of, if we're selected, to keep the town up to date. Um, one thing to be aware of is that written into that grant application is this idea of developing a high injury network. So um, putting all, together all the crash records over the past 20 years is something that I wanted to do to make sure that the town or re and region, um, if selected, was able to be in a good position to, to move forward on that project um, has the data available. No new updates on paid parking. Uh, I know I'd had some questions about that. Where that was left is that there is a new um, uh, traffic safety, I'm going to get the name wrong, um, traffic safety work group, as well as uh, parking group. They've been merged together, but that group will sort of start up once there is a parking coordinator on board. I have not heard any updates on the parking coordinator. Um, Mid-month in December, WPI, our students from Worcester Polytech, uh, finished a loading zone study. I thought they did an excellent job. They have a bunch of practical recommendations about how to potentially improve loading in town. Uh, one of the things that they did, which you know I talked to Mark Willett over at Water about, was trying to get an understanding of uh, moving hydrants, how that can work, how much it's going to cost. And it sounds like in, in talking with Mark that the one on Center Street that's been approved is supposed to move forward. It will cost about 15000 to do. Uh, but once they have the materials in place, they're ready to, to kind of advance that one. So that's good to hear. Some of the other recommendations in that study talk about, you know, looking at signs to see how they how they can become a little bit more comprehensible without losing their Nantucket feel. Um, and also looking at some locations for new loading zones that might be helpful and easy to understand. Sort of the largest takeaway was this need for a consolidated map that shows um, everybody where loading zones are as well as parking regulations. So they're just a little bit easier to access remotely if you're not really in town yet, or if you're about to visit, you can kind of plan ahead. Um, we submitted a request for estimate um, to GPI for stop signs and markings on shared use paths. This is that idea that um, re I think two years ago, the uh, citizen warrant article was put forward to remove stop signs that are facing bicyclists and pedestrians and other users on shared use paths. 
Um, the idea is that there's a 0% compliance rate. And right now it's making drivers a little bit confused because they think a biker or a pedestrian is going to stop and they don't stop. Um, so in the name of safety uh, and acknowledging that users make mistakes but shouldn't have to die for it, the idea is to remove these signs um, and also document where markings need to be removed as well. Uh, DPI is putting together an estimate for us and that will live in the DPW bucket. Um, it will be funded through, through Steve's team. Um, Micromobility. Um, this, at our last meeting in November, there was some discussion about micromobility. I'm not sure if Mr. Topham is here tonight, um, but this will need to be addressed. There is a citizen warrant article on the table um, considering the banning of certain micromobility items. I know we discussed this in the past, our previous meetings, um, but BPAC would need to kind of think about whether or not it wants to take a position and uh, how it will do that. Uh, and then finally, um, some website updates have been um, or were made live, I think, a week ago with some minor changes today uh, by me and Florencia. So there's just a lot more information in the transportation planning section now about the transportation program uh, for the region, how it works, what it does, what the role of the transportation planner uh, planner or program manager is, um, which is helpful. I think there's, there's probably some disambiguation, which is good for folks in town to kind of know who they should go to with different requests. Um, there's also some links in there about how to file a work ticket, things like that, if you need something. So that way, um, things are just a little bit more efficient. A uh, couple items on the horizon to be aware of. Uh, we need to talk with MassDOT. I'm planning to try to do this before my departure about their presentation for performance measures for the long range transportation plan. They're scheduled to do that in February. So we'll have to figure out um, how they will do that and how they want to proceed. And then on the horizon to the FY24 28 tip and FY24 unified planning work program or items um, that sort of in the spring season, you, know, you kind of need to start thinking about. And then by late spring, um, those need to be tied up. So uh, leaving those sort of guidance about those documents. Um, I will do that uh, before before I uh, move on to my next role here. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to everybody for the time that I had here. I know it was short, um, but I was very, very appreciative of all the kindness and guidance that I, I, I received from everybody along the way. It's an excellent place to work, great place to learn about transportation planning and just mm -hmm. full of wonderful people. So um, thank you for that opportunity. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I, I hope I'm speaking for everybody saying we loved having you um, and can only hope the next person will be as good. <laughs> um, I, if I can uh, flip back for a second to the question on the fatalities, um, do you know if they are distributed equally over time over the 20 years of data or are they clustered in any particular um, number of years? Off the cuff, I don't know, but my best sense is they are distributed over a number of years. For our safe, safe streets and roads for all application, um, we had to do reporting on the last five years of crashes, and there was also a fatality metric. And the federal government also has its own database about uh, results of um, injuries, of crashes involving injuries and fatalities. And I believe they were pretty much spread. There were a couple, um, there were one or two years with, with two crashes, but for the most part, things were pretty spread. Um, I know the general macro level trends across the nation that folks have seen during COVID is that actually with fewer cars on the road, they've seen more uh, injury resulting um, crashes. And that's because people are driving faster. There's a sense that less congestion is happening. So that's allowing people to move more quickly. I'm not sure if that's a trend that bears out on Nantucket, um, but that is sort of what's going on in the, in the national sphere. Thank you. And Bert has a comment. Yeah, Patrick, before you go, uh, Nat sort of uh, assured me that we'd get the Tom Nevers bike path in before I die. Uh, we got to break ground in the coming year for that? I hope so. I know I know um, it's one that you're interested in. I'm glad that the, we got a contractor working on that now to design it. And I know there's beyond you, there's a lot of people who are excited about that project. Uh, you know, when we uh, received comments for the win it path item a couple of weeks ago, there were a couple of people who said, this is great. Now let's do Tom Never. So, you know, it's great that uh, that it's on folks radar. And I, I do think it would move forward. And, and I'm happy to hear that there, there are always advocates for these non-motorist projects because they are really important. Well, I got a lot of backlash when 
the paper said that they were putting in the wall when it bike path. I had to explain to people that that was federal money because of the lighthouse. And uh, we're still in the tip program for Tom Nervous. It's, it's definitely a challenge, I think, sometimes um, to kind of understand on we'll win it. It's a, it's a project of opportunity, right? The town was awarded these grants. It has to take action on them. It doesn't necessarily mean the project is more important than some of these other projects. It just means that without those particular discretionary programs, we wouldn't be able to advance something. Uh, so it's it's certainly the case that, you know, I think both are important personally, but um, it's it's not an indication that, you know, one is, you know, better or more worthy than another of moving forward. It's just sort of a, the way it worked out in terms of the funding and when funding was available and what pot it was coming from. Where are you headed now, Patrick? I'm moving up north to another regional plan- planning agency um, just to kind of get get uh, get my feet a little bit more wet up there. Uh, it's a, obviously a little larger in Nantucket. It's the small, smallest regional planning agency, but I'm, I'm looking forward to working with um, the folks who, who kind of fill my shoes uh, later on. You know, there's a lot of cross collaboration across RPAs and transportation management staff. So uh, I think I'll ideally be seeing folks again from, from here. And I'm obviously going to be very interested in, in hearing about what, what happens in some of the projects that I've been following. So are you still going to be in Massachusetts or are you going to New Hampshire? Yes, Massachusetts. Patrick, you'll have to bring a bike back and visit Nantucket on vacation and check out the paths. <laughs> I will certainly do that. Uh, so do you want to uh, elaborate any more on the vacancy update uh, item that we have on the agenda? Or have we covered that at this point? Chair, I just I want to update the commission on where we are with that. Um, the job hosting has now um, been finalized and um, applications are due on Friday, February 3rd. Um, and, um, we have reached out to the a former transportation planner and I know that there is interest on his part in reapplying. So um, definitely thank Patrick for all that he's done. And, you know, that was a two year search. Um, we were certainly, it was uh, an incredibly productive time for him here. Um, and I do hope that um, to have, uh, you know, something before you, um, many of the barriers that we experienced the last time with hiring, which, you know, with the union, with the position being in the union um, are eliminated now. Um, and this will be a direct contract with the commission um, moving forward with whoever fills that job. So uh, we hope to have this on your February agenda. So. Thank you, Andrew. Um, do we have an arrangement for a mass DOT representative to do some of the work as we did last time? Uh, Andrew? Not sure. I was hoping Raisa might uh, step forward with a volunteer uh, offer, but um, I, I know in the past, they certainly have been helpful to me um, as the point of contact when this position was vacant for during that time. Um, hi, yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm happy to take um, the information back to the team and I will get an answer um, from um, Derek and um, Steve. So I'll definitely do that. Thank you, Ray, so I appreciate that. Uh, any further comments from commissioners? Matt. Mary. Hey, thank you, Mary. Um, Patrick, I just want to say thank you from, just from myself uh, to you. Um, we've gotten to know each other pretty well. And our way of doing things over here is certainly going to, I think, help you in your other ventures because there is, we're not the only place that has quirks and we, we do it this way, not that way kind of stuff that happens. And, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to forget you. And anytime you want to come down here, give me a text. And uh, hopefully my apartment will be free and you can bring your family here and enjoy Nantucket. So um, 
you know, I we know. And so also to echo what Andrew said about the difficulty in getting you here, you know, the contact that Leslie and Andrew had with you for, was extensive and it was very difficult. And this position, I think, I think everybody now that needs to know knows how hard this job is. It is not, it might be easier to find a brain surgeon to come to Nantucket and work at the hospital than it is to find this job. I mean, it's ridiculous how complicated this is because of all this stuff that the state requires. It, it, it's, it's just complicated and it has gotten worse. So, you know, your field of expertise is different than, than most things. So, um, appreciate it. And I look, I wish you the best and hope this was the right decision for you. And I hope we hope our, your time here was helpful for you. That's, that's really what I'm saying. So thank you. I definitely appreciate it. I, I think it was an excellent opportunity. I learned so much. And um, like I said previously, I think, I think the best thing that I'll take away is the great people that, that work on the Island and live on the Island. It's a, it's a great unique place. And I, I was really beneficial to have worked here for a little bit. Thank you, Patrick. Right. Uh, if there are no other comments, um, Patrick, this, this may be the last time we see you. So uh, Godspeed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the next on our agenda is an update on the DLTA funding. Um, is that uh, Andrew? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I don't know if this was included in your packet, but basically our DLTA, which stands for District Local Technical Assistance Funding, available to the state's RPAs, um, has been uh, approved. Um, our normal amount is $50,000. It's been uh, increased to 83300 this year. This uh, funding uh, can be used towards either projects of our own initiative or projects of the town's initiative. There's an extensive um, list of the kind of projects that are basically about smart planning. Um, we've used it uh, before for open, some, well, for master planning, for affordable housing and other similar projects. Um, I would ask the commission to um, affirm my vote on the contract. There were sort of time constraints to get that done. Um, which uh, you know indicate that we do accept that uh, grant award from the state. So, I'll make that motion, Madam Chair. Thank you, Bert. Do we have a second? Second. Um, sorry, I missed who that was. Was that Barry? Yeah. Okay. And uh, any further discussion? All right. If not, we'll take a roll call vote. Seth Engelberg. Aye. Lucy Parentella. Aye. Uh, Don had to drop off. Uh, Wendy Hudson. Wendy, you're muted. Did you hear me? I said, oh, aye. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Dave Iverson? Aye. Bert Johnson? Aye. Matt Lowell? Matt? Muted. Aye, Madam Chair, sorry. Uh, Barry Rector? Aye. And John Trudell? Aye. Uh, and Mary Longacre, aye. Thank you. Um, Okay, so Andrew, you're all set on that uh, letter. You have our endorsement of your acceptance. I don't think we have anything else to do there. Um, so next is the update on the open space and recreation plan. And again, I think that's you, Andrew. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So thank you all for those who have sent in comments, especially you, Madam Chair, who I know did an extensive read of the uh, plan and, and uh, gave quite a bit of uh, feedback. I have now received feedback from the town manager who also conducted a very extensive review. And um, today on my conversation with Patrick with the consultant on the Tom Nevers bike path, we discussed the open space plan as well. So a few uh, changes are, are scheduling to keep in mind here. Um, if there are any further comments from commissioners, I would like to get them all I would say by no later than the end of next week, which would be the 6th of February. Um, um, so 6th would be Monday. I'm sorry. Um, 
whatever the Friday is, if you could just, right. And uh, at our meeting in February, I hope to have a final, final draft incorporating all of the comments that were made. Um, during this next month, the plan will be reviewed by the planning board as required under state regs. Um, and then hopefully this will, um, after that, I would hope um, we have a final, final draft to review. Uh, we talked about another 30 day review for any further public review um, where after that we would finalize our review and the select board would have their, I guess, final, completely final last review in April. Um, as you know, this plan, um, you know, has had a, has had a numerous, I guess, impediments over the years. Um, it is very important that we received a draft approval. Um, a new round of funding came out recently for uh, trail funding and, and other things. I don't know if the town intends to apply for those, but with the draft plan approved, um, uh, the town is not uh, prevented from applying for grants where they would have been in the past. Uh, it is important, however, that this plan be finalized by the town um, in order for us to receive funding. So again, our schedule still works for all that, but there really cannot be any further um, delays. This, this needs to move forward and be settled um, you know, in the next couple months. So... Thank you, Andrew. So we'll look for that um, revised draft coming back to us. Um, did you say uh, hopefully at our next meeting? Definitely at your February meeting, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, comments or questions from commissioners on that topic? All right, seeing none, uh, moving on to the discussion of the NP and EDC mission. And Megan, you have uh, a chart to share on the screen, I believe. So Andrew, um, did a really nice job of charting out the different sections that we want to look at and uh, the reasons why we might want to change things and has some questions for us to consider. Um, it's a tremendous visual aid as we think about the, in particular, the mission for the NPNEDC tonight, um, but also the other aspects. Uh, wait for that to come up. Just thinking about it, there we go. All right, so um, briefly across the top, the column headers, um, different reasons why the legislation um, might be changed. And then the uh, row headers down the left-hand side, different parts of the language in the legislation. Um, and Andrew, we wanted to focus on the mission in particular uh, because the, the name and the composition and the responsibilities flow somewhat from the mission. So that, that is our focus tonight. Although certainly commissioners who might have comments in other areas related to that um, can offer them. And this will be, again, an ongoing discussion as it has been so far. Um, this is not a final word tonight. Uh, Andrew, do you wanna start us off? Sure, and thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I do wanna point out too that, you know, the the language that I've included here is is, you know, from our discussion, I believe at the November meeting. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm assuming I haven't heard much, uh, I guess, pushback on, you know, some of the reasons which as you explained are along the, you know, the top row. Um, I do think it's important if we do, you know, follow through with this exercise that we look at all the sections of our bylaw. And um, I know we'll have time to do that. We'll. I think, you know, again, there's a lot to think about in each one of these rows and columns. Um, and there may, there may be other ideas that sort of pop up along the way as well. We want to use this as a working document to sort of, um, I guess, map out our discussions as they go along. So um, the mission section, we had a little bit of discussion the last time from commissioners. 
um, the first the first row after why amend the legislation you know talks about um, what current language is. Um, I know there was discussion about you know physical, social, and economic resources of the island. Um, the physical, social, and economic is language that does appear in at least the statewide um, uh, the statewide regional planning authorization language. There's there's other reasons uh, that are included in Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard. Uh, don't know if any of those appealed to commissioners, but those are things to think about. Um, and again, the what I've included in red is sort of our uh, compilation of some of our staff ideas, some of the commission ideas that we've talked about. So there, I don't have a proposed um, new mission yet. Um, it's something that I think we need to, you know, uh, think about and sort of um, uh, having other discussions about. Um, when it comes to removing outdated practices and language, uh, you know, I don't know how people feel about the word orderly. Um, it's to me that it might be a little bit outdated. Um, we talked about removing confusion and providing, cl providing clarity. And I do think that as we've already provided you that you know, planning is something that all island organizations do. Um, the select board, the um, sewer committee, the land bank, you know, no matter what, there is planning occurring in all of these groups. So I think one of the things that I that I think we should recognize, at least in our own mission, is that we're not sort of planning other people's um. I guess jurisdictions, um, and I think what happens in most RPAs, where you have multiple towns, um, multiple individual organizations, um, the the goal in those places is to bring all of that work together, right? To take the work of on the vineyard, for example, the six towns, and make sure that you know things are consistent and working together. Um, here, I think what we're doing. Is, is is not planning for others is that we're actually assisting them in their planning. Um, think that we're um, providing, you know, studies and professional services and other things, um, you know, to help basically, you know, these other groups. And that, that goes along with the two next thoughts about, you know, to be clear here that we're, um, we're not creating inconsistencies uh, and we're not conflicting with the town that we're here to assist the town, you know, the town and county of Nantucket, you know, build their connections through, um, I guess, a, a, a greater uh, overview that connects to state and other regions. Um, and that that's what we've kind of tried to do, at least over the years. Um, one example of that is the professional services uh, to the town through the PLUS agreement. And again, it's not uncommon for regional planning agencies to enter into contracts with the town to provide various levels of services. That PLUS agreement from 2012 was really the first time that that was done after years of sort of, you know, it was just assumed, you know, how everything was going to was going to happen. Also, improving effectiveness. I think the current language, you know, is very broad, as we've talked about. Um, other RPA enabling legislations uses, I guess, entire sections to define what terms mean. Um, some of these terms have no definition. They're subject to interpretation, not only by commissioners, but other people reading it as well. Um, and I think if you, if you have spent any time looking at some of those other um, ruling laws, you'll see that, that 
there is an effort to make sure that things are, are actually defined. Oh, that's, I don't know if you have all had a chance to read over any of this. Um, that's, that's where uh, we are right now in terms of the mission part of this. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, comments from commissioners? Uh, Megan, you might want to leave that up. I'm, I'm good with being able to see people's hands. Um, if you want to go ahead and leave that on the screen. Barry, go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, you know, the, the biggest challenge we've always talked about, it, it's tough to define this maybe even a little more for us since we are the one town regional planning agency. We're not reaching out across to several uh, towns and, and, and cities to be able to do this. Um, the thing I would like to be able to do is so um, we are getting forward momentum is proposed that by next month, we close out this section um, and then kind of move along. Doesn't mean we can't go back to it but I would kind of like to put definitive timeframes on things so that we're not languishing on this. Um, I mean, Andrew's done a good job. I really appreciate this because this, this was a very positive step in terms of doing this, but I, I think there's a point where we've got to say, okay, we're pretty good here. Next section, let's move along. Um, you know, we may find something we need that forces us to go back, but that's okay. Um, they, you know, at least there's a good reason for it. The other thing I'd really encourage is, as well is not to use language which is ambivalent or um, favorite planning term, void for vagueness, because there's a lot of things that I was looking at that were referring to quality of life that was mentioned as a mission. And that has got to be one of the most ambiguous terms I've ever said. If you're going to put something in there, you also need to define the parameters underneath it. So in looking, I did a brief bit of homework and I actually found something from, who was it there? Uh, Franklin County, Franklin Regional Planning Agency, who had done a really good job because they were one of the first ones who steered clear of that, that, that very uh, vague language. Uh, and intonations in there. So I, I'd be happy to share that with you all. Whereas when I looked at other things like Martha's Vineyard or the Cape Cod Commission, they, they were quick to glom on to that. Um, fine and well, but again, we're subject to interpretation of this, not only amidst ourselves, but also for the public as well too, that we serve. And that's where I think we need to be greatly careful. Um, lessons learned from the past. So I'm either happy to share the Franklin thing with you, or we can hold it aside and I'll get it to you before the end of next month, uh, before we meet next month. So it's all up to you. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if we are prepared to examine that on the screen sort of live it might be best to send it to Megan um, with, with your notes about what you liked about it and have her send that out to all of us if, if you don't mind Barry yeah and actually actually I, I'm going to make sure that Andrew directly gets to see that first because you know he's he's probably got the the best experience of, with anyone outside of dealing with RPAs um, and it would be good to take things like this and kind of just vet it through him uh, at the onset of things. So thanks. Um, yes, uh, sorry, I have a hand up from Seth and then uh, was it Nat? That would be great, Mary. Thank you. I put my hand up correctly. Seth, go ahead. And then Dave, I see your hand as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I mean, I think it's important to get the language of the mission right. Um, but it might need some time so that this doesn't turn into a grammatical workshop. I do have a few minor points. I think our scope does extend beyond the island of Nantucket. It also, in my opinion, includes the islands of Tuckernuck, Muskegon, and our surrounding waters. So I'd like to see that 
um, encompassed in the mission. And then I think the um, concept of, you know, plan versus coordinate, I see that our regional commission really, you know, as Andrew said, everyone is doing their own plans. Our job is to coordinate between departments and um, other boards to ensure kind of regional uh, effective planning. So I think we could just say coordinate development and protection. And then lastly, in terms of physical resources, although I'm fine with that term, if that's a term that's used in you know the state regulations, it's a little bit vague, you know, is physical only related to natural resources? Is it, does it accompany the built environment? Um, so I think we might need a little bit of specificity on what is physical resources. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Nat? Yes, Madam no, Chair, yeah, thank you. I just wanna just, uh, we're talking just about the first two. So I wanna just comment on what Andrew said. Um, well, one of the things that he said, I thought was like one of the most important points in this entire, this conversation is the, his ex explanation about other boards and, and you know, commissions all doing some kind of planning. I think that needs to be fully understood and sort of as we move forward into this, you know, new era that we're in now, that word planning gets very confusing and sort of assumed what it means. And it's, we've seen that, especially in the past couple of years, especially with like what's going on with housing and land use and the value of land and how little there's left and nobody thought about what this was gonna be like, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff fits into what Andrew's talking about. We have we have the affordable housing trust that's doing planning. I mean, everybody's doing something. And I, mean, I think that's a really healthy thing, especially with this community is one, is one town, but it has so many moving parts. And there's no way one board or one commission could, could handle whatever that word planning means. Um, to follow up on something Seth said about the regional, in oceans, I want to add one more thing to what he said, and I want to add Barnstable. There's a reason why I'm saying that. Barnstable is our second home. And, you know, I hate to, you know, expose how long I've been around doing this, but Barnstable is forgotten, and Nantucket's forgotten sometimes. And my sort of little, I have a small little thought over the years that we could formalize through this board, this commission, a relationship, a formal relationship with Barnstable on occasion, like whether it be once a year, whether it be just through staff, doesn't matter. Just so they don't forget that we're here and we don't forget that they're there because we have, we're buying four new boats at the steamship well, three, but there'll be a fourth. And there's a we have a relationship with, with Barnstable that is beyond most people's understanding. This is stuff that I talk to Mary about a lot with the with the boat lines and the and the relationship with Highline and so forth. And I think that this commission moving forward into another era is going to be one of the most important things that we never discuss is our relationship with Barnstable. So I like the word regional for those reasons that Seth mentioned, the ocean plan. I think he was kind of referring to that a little bit and, and obviously what's going on with the wind and stuff. But, but I want to add that, add Barnstable to that sort of thinking process for everyone. Um, and definitely this economic development thing, you know, Wendy is, is on tonight and, has heard this over and over again as something that is confusing. We had Shanta on tonight, and I think she should be on more often, maybe two or three times a year or more, to discuss different things that are going on, especially post COVID. Now that we're sort of coming back to normal, um, 
as far as as far as the economics and the and downtown and, and businesses. Um, but that term definitely needs to be eliminated um, because of its vague definition and assumption and perception issues that people have for what we are or aren't supposed to be doing. So um, that's all I have right now, Madam Chair, but I just wanted to throw that in. Seth always says something that catches my ear. And I just wanted to add that Barnstable thing to this to that part of what he was saying. Thank you. Thank you, Nat. Dave? Um, I, I support Nat's Barnstable thought. I think that they're, they're too important part of our uh, existence here on the island not to have some some sort of tie in here. Um, uh, my question is is more about process and maybe through you, Madam Chair, to Andrew. What do you, how do you see this process going on? I mean, I think the work you've done is great and it all makes sense, but how, what's the process here? How are we going to go about doing this? So, uh, thanks um, for that. Um, I think, um, as you know, this, you know, effort to look at our um, enabling legislation came about after a citizen article in town meeting voted to refer this back for us to look at and consider. Um, you know, I think when you realize, as I did, that, you know, the commission is coming up on its 50th anniversary in August, that, um, you know, we've done, you know, I think amended the um amended it four different times, but not any any time in a really comprehensive way. Um, in each case, it's sort of been, you know, reacting to something um, that, you know, the effort to do such a major thing should be done comprehensively, you know, with full discussion and, and sort of understanding what we're doing. So what I think is that we will have this on agendas for some time here. Um, you know, to, there are some major points that, that still have to be discussed. I mean, not the least of which is the financing and the future structure. Um, and I think that this would either be something that we submit directly to the state or that we bring forward, you know, when it's an appropriate time to, to town meeting for reconsideration. Um, there are other items, you know, that have an, somewhat of an impact on this, and it's impossible. This is something I talked with uh, our chairwoman about is, you know, how do you predict if the, the st overall structure of t all of town government is going to be, you know, um, changed at all here? Um, but it's something that I think we have to consider as we do this as well. Um, because there, there may be other home rule petitions, you know, that come out of that headed to the state at the same time. So at this point, I think to can, you know, continue our discussion and there will be language um, developed and put in front of you. Um, you all have not given me an indication that you want, you've set a certain timeline here. Um, it's something I, I think that we would have on our agenda. I could see, you know, pretty much for the next six months or so uh, as we sort of go through these different sections. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Dave, do you have anything to follow up or is that? I, I think that covers it. Thank you, Andrew and Madam Chair. Um, not seeing other hands at the moment, I want to offer a few um, observations. And Megan, I'm sorry, could you put that chart back up for me? <laughs> um, I, I appreciate and agree with the, the idea of a regional focus. Um, in particular, you know, everything that we have over here starts on the Cape. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense, as Nat said, to consider what's going on in Barnstable and to have a dialogue with them so that we are able to uh, work together to make sure that, that things are happening in an orderly fashion to, to use the old fashioned word there. Um, and also with Martha's Vineyard, they have some of the same issues that we have and uh, a dialogue with them would be helpful to learn from each other. 
Um, so I, I like that regional focus. Um, one of the things that jumps out at me from this chart are um, on the existing language, the coordinated uh, in the center, uh, planning for our island organizations is occurring in many different places, uh, the professional services to the town. I, I'd like to see some language that sort of brings all of that together to, um, to say, you know, what we do. Um, we, we help the town coordinate, we help provide services to the town, we help fill in gaps where the town isn't able to address issues. Um, you know, something that, that is more specific about what we do than just uh, plan for orderly and coordinated development. And um, see if I can catch the last thought that I had. Uh, oh yeah, the, the word social. Um, that's not one that we've paid a lot of attention to. And it's one of those vague terms. Does that mean social services like mental health? Does that mean cultural resources like um, you know, events and um, opportunities for cultural enrichment? Does that mean uh, quality of life, that much maligned term? Uh, so I'd, I'd like to uh, be a little bit more specific about what social means. Uh, I agree with Seth, be more specific about what physical means. And, and with Nat, you'd be more specific about what economic means to us as a commission. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see more specificity in there. Um, those are some of my thoughts. And uh, Barry, I saw your hand was up as well, if you wanna continue. Thanks. So that, uh, maybe I'm gonna run this through Andrew, just uh, on the side here, but, um, I guess the question is, how do you all feel about trying to, as I said earlier, deal with these sections, but also begin to close them out a little bit as well, too, which means that between this month and next month, um, you you all get a chance to feed back to Andrew what you see as as the mission for this and some of the appropriate verbiage for it. <laughs> we have the discussion and then say, okay, great. Let's move along to the next section. Doesn't mean we can't revisit it because there are other wheels in motion. Um, you know, the other thing that, let me stop right there for a second. Let me just stop right there. I, I'm curious to see how you all feel about that thought. Comments from commissioners to Barry's question. Uh, Seth, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, I know we're in a tough place because of open, open meeting law restrictions, but you know, in a normal organization uh, for asynchronous uh, mission review, you would take the words, you would like track changes in the document, and then you would meet to debrief and um, coalesce around what's the important things. I know we can't exactly do that, but we could submit all of our comments to staff. Staff could pull out some of the, mm -hmm. let's say, um, overarching themes and then review. So I'm in favor of that generally. I would say I'm hesitant to close out sections because good planning, as we go down this, when we get to composition and responsibilities and all the next sessions sections may require additional changes to prior sections. I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't know if closeout is like we're talking about walking it or we're talking about just trying to um, segment it out. As long as we're not completely refusing to look back, then I'm fine with kind of compartmentalizing things at, at least, but I don't want to, close out sections too early. Thank you, Seth. I, I think um, you, you and I share that approach that I, I think a focus is appropriate uh, and that focus will shift from meeting to meeting, but I'm not comfortable with, with the concept of closing something out uh, and then even reopening it to revisit it. I, I could see us building a draft of a document um, where, where the, we start adding sections um, beginning with the mission and, and add more to it. And, and as you pointed out, we may come to a point where we say, well, we have to adjust the earlier language, but I see it as one document that we draft rather than separate buckets. Uh, Barry, go ahead. 
like I said, I, I'm struggling to choose some of the right concepts and words here. Uh, but let me be clear when I said closing it out also meant that we could go back to it as well, too. I'm trying to just see if instead of languishing on certain things and the mission thing taking six months and fine tuning and wordsmithing that we kind of start addressing it as, okay, we've got a very definitive point where we're going to move into the next section. And if we, and like I said, if we find that we, we need to revisit it, that's great. But I think instead of just leaving it amorphous that in order to get work product done sometimes you've got to give people timelines and, and deadlines to kind of move along and that's where i feel very strongly about it the the other thing i wanted to say was that please keep in mind too when you're reviewing this document you are you are looking pert near 50 years in the past when this was created and we were very very different place and at a very very different time and a lot of things that were going on at that juncture so as much as you i don't want us to get too stuck in the language here of what's pre-existing because it's it's old language it really is and we have moved light years beyond where this document was first thought done and thought of and what the concepts were for the island at that time so that really is is just something else that I, I think I would like to just say, please keep in the back of your head when you're doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. I agree. We should be looking with today's eyes, uh, looking forward much more than trying to look backward 50 years. Yeah. Ma but next, just, can I just make one quick comment to just sort of clarify a little bit of this? I, you know, like you brought up that word social, and I didn't even catch that as a sort of a you know, it's one of those words from the past that sort of thrown out there that, well, what does it really mean? And that might be the least defined word in the original mission. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to just say having other, like, for example, having like the chamber on once in a while, having, Chant you know, the Chantaz, you know, in that position now, but she might not be in it in 10 years having the water company on, on occasion, um, just to give us sort of an update um, of things like having David Gray on or his, his uh, you know, future replacement at some point. Those are the kind of things that sort of, you know, provide that planning tool that, that that definition, but by those other boards and other entities that are doing their planning. So I think that that's the way things need to be in the future. It isn't us, it's us maybe gathering them together on some of our meetings as, a, as an agenda item, you know, once or twice a year and, and, and including what they're saying so that, so that we can better uh, do our job and, and, and the planning board as well. So I think that that's important as far as like the future and, and, and eliminating some of the past thinking. I mean, back in 1973, I mean, there wasn't a thought about growth, overgrowth, what was going to happen in 20 years. Nobody ever could have predicted what's going to, what was going to happen. Um, I think we got a better handle on what's going to happen in the future now than we would have 30 years ago in the sense of you know, fast ferries and, and, and tourism, the way it is today is completely different. So um, I just wanted to throw that in as part of, you know, our sort of mission moving forward. I know that doesn't have to be in language, but in, in how staff, um, you know, coordinates things with other departments. So thank you. Thank you, Nat. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring up in this sense, and uh, some of the, the comments Andrew has in the document are hinting at it, um, we have to keep in mind what our capabilities are, um, uh, as well as what we're not supposed to do. We're, we're not supposed to replace or compete with the select board and their strategic plan. 
Um, we don't have a staff of six people ready to carry out things that we want to do. We don't have millions of dollars in funding waiting to be spent. So as we consider the mission, we need to consider our capabilities and, uh, and also look at what we do have. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll have a senior planner position funded in the next budget. Uh, we have just funded a uh, sustainability manager in the past budget, and Vince Murphy has been uh, hired in that position. Uh, I know that when Hudson had brought up the climate action plan, and that is one of the priorities for the sustainability manager. Um, so that might be an area where we might look and see, well, does this have a regional focus? Does this have, uh, it has a staff person, it has a budget. Um, is that something that is uh, important to this commission? And, and what other resources do we have that we can make available to the town to help in that? Um, so that's perhaps an example of what we might look at and say, well, does this fit our mission or should our mission be um, adjusted to fit the things that we're capable of uh, as well as vice versa? So that's a thought just to keep in mind. Um, and, and, and again, not to compete with or duplicate what other parts of the town are already doing. Other thoughts or comments from commissioners? All right, so I, I think my intention is that we have a focus at each of our upcoming meetings on one of these areas, uh, as well as a review of um, perhaps some draft language coming from the planning department or um, questions from the planning department uh, so that we are looking back at our most recent conversation and updating or affirming that and also continuing to look at other areas of the uh, legislation to suggest potential changes and, and bat around ideas. Uh, Barry, I do take your point that we wanna keep this moving forward. We don't wanna spend six months wordsmithing one little section, um, certainly not what I wanna do. But if there's nothing more on this topic, um, go ahead with the agenda, um, discussion uh, articles of planning concern. And again, there was a list in the packet uh, provided to us of articles that staff is recommending that we discuss. Uh, Megan, if you can go ahead and put that list up. And I thought we would take the uh, two that have a question mark in terms of the staff recommendation and save those for last, but otherwise we can begin at the beginning. Um, Andrew, some of these we are already pretty familiar with. Um, do you need a, a motion or a resolution on them individually? Is this just a discussion overall? Uh, do we wanna uh, look at comments to be provided to other agencies on these specific articles? What do we wanna to accomplish tonight? Thank you, Madam Chair. So I think this is um, an annual exercise that we go through. We're actually ahead of the curve a little bit this year. We're one month early uh, and I, you know that the warrant hasn't been adopted yet, but hopefully that's going to happen um, this coming. So what we do is uh, the commission is not in a position to recommend these articles um, as a, a binding vote. I think, as you know, the um, articles that go before town meeting receive a motion from the finance committee or the planning board. So planning board recommends on zoning matters. The finance committee recommends on everything else. The finance committee is now moving into, and in some cases already started, their review of various articles. So during their public hearings, um, various individuals or groups can comment on them. So uh, this exercise for us has generally been um, if there are articles that we think, we collectively think are of planning concern that we want to comment on, uh, share opinions with uh, the finance committee uh, in their deliberations about how they will recommend certain articles, uh, we do that. So our first, um, and, and this is not a public hearing, again, public hearings on uh, most of these articles will be held at the Finance Committee. Um, we do not have zoning articles uh, on this particular list. Those will be held 
you know, that public hearing will go before the planning board. And that's not to say that, you know, this list is exhaustive or, um, you know, commissioners may have other ideas on what is important. Uh, this, this first, uh, I guess, iteration is developed by the professional staff for your consideration. Does that make sense? Do you have, does anybody have questions about the process here? Um, so Andrew, again, what are we trying to accomplish tonight? Are we trying to get to comments or is this an, an early discussion? Well, it's an early discussion to see if there are articles of planning concern that you would like to make. What we do with this list is we turn it into some sort of a document that heads over to the finance committee. So yes, if they're if you're ready to, you know, take some sort of position on any of these, we'd like to know. And if there are others that you want to push off for further discussion or further consideration, that can happen as well. Okay, so let's start with the well, when it road shared use path. That should be pretty easy because that is coming out of our department. Uh, I, I would assume that we would want to make a statement that supports the adoption of this article. Is there any discussion or any other um, motion that we want to take on this particular one? Madam Chair, you skipped over Surfside area. I, I apologize. Um, They're both the same. The easy, yeah, it took the easiest one first. <laughs> them together, yes. Yeah. Um, so, so just continuing for a moment with the well, when it one, since I've already brought that one up, um, is there anyone who wants to offer a comment that we would provide to other agencies? regarding this article. Okay. Or do we we do do we want to simply motion to a, a recommend adoption? Dave, I saw your hand. Um uh, yeah, I mean I think that the staff's comment is is about all we really have to say is that this is in keeping and advance our transportation goals. And I, I think that's an, enough of a comment, I would imagine. Okay. Um, yeah. do, again, do we need individual motions on these? Do, are we are we at that stage, that um, or do you, are you just looking for direction from us? No, I would actually like, Madam Chair, uh, individual motions. Um, motion one would be it is, you know, and you could sort of merge these together if you wanted. That um, if they're both, if you feel they're both of planning concern, and um, you could adopt the uh, staff comment if you want. Okay. You, so you, mean on, you mean on the first two, right, Andrew? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Okay. Before we take the motion, then any further comment on the Surfside Area Road Reconstruction and Transportation Improvement article? Just want to make sure we have an opportunity if anyone has a question or comment before we lump those two together. All right, Barry, I see your hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, you know, here's the thing. I, I instead of making this a, a, a 12 point exercise or even a 10 point exercise. Um, staff has done a lot of work and I think you see everything before you at this point. It may be a little bit more expedient to have the commissioners isolate out anything that they wanna talk about right now. Otherwise, I think we go with what we see before us at this point. Um, that would be my I'm thought. Not, yeah, thank you, Barry. I'm, I'm not prepared to do that. I think there's quite a variety here um, that we may want to break things apart. Um, but thank you for the suggestion. I appreciate the hour uh, that we're at here. Yeah. Uh, would anyone well, like to make a motion for the first two listed, the Surfside and Well Win It articles, to uh, recommend adoption with the staff comment that they advance transportation goals? So I'll move. Second. And I got a second there from Dave. Roll call vote, Seth Engelborg. Aye. Christy Ferrantella. Aye. Wendy Hudson. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Bert Johnson. Is Bert, Bert are you? Oh, Bert's uh, He's on unavailable. The phone. Moment. Yeah. Uh, Nat Lowell. Aye. Gary Rector. Aye. John Trudell. Aye. Mary Longacre, I. So that's with Bird abstaining. Um, the um, third one, amend description of public works facility. 
Is there anyone who has a discussion on that or would we like to make a motion to recommend adoption with the staff comments that it will provide operational efficiency and allevi alleviate traffic? And I believe that was supposed to be emissions, not omissions in the staff comment. Do we have a motion or a comment? So, so move, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Second. Thank you, Dave. Roll call vote, Seth Engelborg. Aye. Christy Varantella. Aye. Wendy Hudson. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Kurt Johnson. Aye. Uh, Nat Lowell. Aye. Mary Rector. Aye. John Trudell. Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. Uh, next one up, the uh, appropriation for HDC administrator. Um, so on this one, we have a staff recommending not to adopt with comments that the article is not um, in proper form. Uh, are there any further comments or would anybody like to make a motion to uh, recommend that the article not be adopted with the staff comments attached? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Christy. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Nat. Roll call vote, Seth Engelborg. Aye. Christy Farantella. Aye. Wendy Hudson. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Kurt Johnson. Aye. Matt Lowell. Aye. Barry Rector. Aye. John Trudell. Aye. Mary Longacre, aye. Um, the two with question marks, as I said, I want to move those to the end of the discussion. The town council form of government. Um, again, we have a recommendation from the staff not to adopt. Uh, and the articles are not in the proper form. Do we have any comments or would somebody like to make a motion to follow the staff's recommendation? I'll make that motion. Thank Second. you, Dave. Second from Bert. Roll call vote, Seth Engelborg. Aye. Christy Farantella. Aye. Wendy Hudson. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Bert Johnson. Aye. Matt Lowell. Aye. Barry Rector. Aye. John Trudell? Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. Uh, the Home Rule Petition for Conveyances to the Land Bank. Um, and there is a similar article, uh, the Real Estate Acquisition and Conveyance for 31 Easy Street. Can we take those together or does anyone have comments on those two? If there are no comments, we'll take a we'll motion. Take a motion. On staff's recommendation to uh, recommend approval uh, with the comments that are provided. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Christy. Second. Thank you, Dave. Roll call vote, Seth Engelborg. Aye. Christy Farantella. Aye. Wendy Hudson. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Kurt Johnson. Aye. Matt Lowell. Aye. Mary Rector. Aye. John Trudell. Aye. And Mary Langacre, aye. Um, remaining the home rule position for NPNEDC, uh, the staff recommends not to adopt. Uh, that article, article has um, faults, and as we all know, we are pursuing the same topic um, on our own initiative. Uh, any further comments on this article, or do we want to make a recommendation not to adopt? The so moved, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Second. Thank you, Dave. Roll call vote, Seth Engelborg. Aye. Christy Farantella. Aye. Wendy Hudson. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Kurt Johnson. Aye. Matt Lowell. Aye. Mary Rector. Aye. John Trudell. Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. All right, we have two articles, uh, the motorized passenger device. Um, this is a citizen's article. This is something that we had hoped that the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee would be able to address. Um, Andrew, do we have any further information on um, if they will be able to address that? Uh, I know that with Patrick's departure, meetings for that committee are um, more difficult. Uh, do we have a timeline or anything that we can talk about here? Um, not. Um, it's something we could ask them. Um, to take up before our next meeting. Um, that is something the, the commission wants to consider. Um, 
I will say that it's, you know, the, without, you know, Patrick's or without a transportation manager specific expertise, there is really no staff. There's, there isn't going to be staff support for that group until that position is filled. Mm -hmm. Barry, you have a comment? I'll, I'll let Seth go first, if you don't mind. Oh, okay, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. So it's unfortunate that, you know, BPAC is going to have reduced capacity to handle this issue. Um, and I know our BPAC representative is not here today, but I think for several reasons, we should uh, issue a negative recommendation on this article. Um, the first is very, I would say, straightforward. The article as proposed doesn't do anything different than chapter 91 of the Town of Nantucket Code. Uh, chapter 91 of the Nantucket Code already prohibits these motorized passenger devices. And all that the proposed article is hoping to do is increase the specificity of that prohibition. But you don't need specificity of a prohibition when there's already a blanket prohibition. Um, so I, I think the article, even if passed, won't have any measurable legal change, which is the first reason we should not support it. The second is I've presented to this board, to the select board, and uh, I'd hope to present at some point to BPAC, but I think that there are very good reasons to support the use of uh, micromobility devices on Nantucket as long as they are well regulated. And I think that if the article sponsor had just given the appropriate um, commissions and town staff time to think of the ways to do this, we could have easily gotten to a place where chapter 91 of the Code of Nantucket was altered to allow for specific use with restrictions that made sense um, in terms of safety, but also allowed for the continued use of these devices that have measurable benefits to the community in terms of um, reducing the reliance on vehicular trans transportation. Um, also, there are environmental benefits from reduced uh, fossil fuel emissions. There are benefits in terms of uh, justice outcomes because these devices typically are much less expensive and much easier to store than cars. Um, and it's, you know, honestly just a pleasant way to get around the town. There's aesthetic quality and mental health benefits to the, the use of these devices. So I think that for a variety of reasons, it would be a, a very bad outcome for the community to ban these devices beyond the ban that already exists. And what we should actually be doing is focusing on how we can submit these devices in a responsible way. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Seth. Uh, we'll go to Nat and then uh, back to Barry. I'm gonna agree with everything Seth just said and go to Barry. He said everything I can't, couldn't say better. Thank you. Thank you, Nat. Barry? I agree with Seth completely. So I would move that we send this off with a negative recommendation. Uh, I, I was going to say that I also agree with Seth. I would. Oh, also... sorry. <laughs> uh, but please, uh, I, I have no uh, no reason to stop you, Barry. If you'd like to make that motion, I would. Uh, do we have a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Bert. Roll call vote. Seth Engelborg. Aye. Steve Garantello. Aye. Wendy Hudson. Aye. Steve Anderson. Aye. Bert Johnson. Aye. Matt Lowell? Aye. Barry Rector? Aye. John Trudell? Aye. And Mary Longacre? Aye. So we're making a uh, recommendation not to adopt that article. And yeah. the outdoor lighting article, uh, again, staff did not provide a recommendation. Um, do we have comments on that article? Barry? 
I would just to be expedient here say that we're we're going to make that I'd like to make that same motion but again we can do that in a few minutes if we need to hear from the other commissioners first I'm happy to wait a few moments but that's that's the direction I'd like to head thank you Barry I do have a comment but other commissioners first Seth? thank you madam chair just very quickly uh I think that from my you know, limited knowledge of outdoor lighting, reviewing the current text and the draft, the draft new text. I think that there is a clear um, need for a update to the current text, but I am not necessarily an expert. I know the article sponsor submitted some written um, information to us, which I reviewed. It would be good if we have an opportunity to have them present. I would appreciate that. Or to have somebody from the town, like potentially the energy coordinator, to give us a staff review of what they think so that we could get a little bit more of a, a rounded out analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Uh, other comments before I go ahead? Madam Chair, can I just... Yes. I didn't, put, I didn't put my hand up. Sorry, um, Leslie. Would you mind kind of kind of giving us the I don't know the dark skies um, sort of quick analysis? Is there is there room like 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 Seth said? Actually, made a good point. Is that there's room for improvement, but like we need to we'll look at it, you know, from a practical point and sort of at a staff level and. Maybe something for the next year. Is that is that where we sort of are with this? In your eyes, because when we this stuff comes up at planning board applications all the time, and with today's to current technology, LEDs, um, you know, everything is sort of aiming to the ground. I mean, there's a lot of it's sort of going faster than the rules that we probably have. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So the current bylaw. Um, am I frozen? Um, the current bylaw, I believe, is from 2005. It was a citizen petition that was presented to town meeting. It was approved. It was a step in the right direction, but it hasn't changed at all since then. And technology's changed. Um, a lot's changed since then. So Nantucket Lights and Gail Walker um, have, you know, met with me several times. They were interested in something that had um, a better enforcement mechanism and had a little more teeth and a little more restriction than our current bylaw. So, you know, that's what they've been working on over the past year. I think what's presented at town meeting is a big shift from what we have now. And, you know, I don't think that we're adequately prepared at the staff level to deal with that. I mean, it's highly technical. It would require um, at least another full-time staff person, if not more to review you know, every single application um, to see if their lighting complies with this bylaw. I mean, there's a lot of restrictions in here. And I know that a lot of that was driven, at least through my conversations with Gail Walker, about wanting to have Nantucket designated as a um, dark sky community by the, I'm going to get the name wrong, but the International Dark Sky Association or, or something to that effect. So I know that's why the article is drafted the way it is in many ways. So I guess, you know, the conversation should be, is that something that's important to our community or do we, you know, just want to have some better regulations? So, you know, I think this is a, a good starting point for a lot of conversation, but it's a major shift from where we are now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And thank you, Nat, for asking. So. Uh, I'm curious whether or not the commission would like to bring this back um, specifically as a topic to have Gail Warco present the article to us to have feedback from the public safety department about uh, enforcement, uh, to have additional feedback from the planning department about staffing and, and what it would mean. Uh, I, I wonder if this is something that can be tweaked in order to be recommended, um, but I'm certainly not prepared to do that without um, further explanation. So if the commission is interested, we could request a presentation and try and arrange that. Um, or we can simply uh, take no action. 
or we could make a motion to not to recommend in its current form. Uh, any of those are on the table. Barry? Thank you. Um, I'm going to admit to you right now, I'm a big Dark Skies in initiative fan. All right. So for me to be saying not to adopt at this point is is pretty radical. Um, but I think Leslie's right. I read through the document. There are a number of technicalities in there that are not going to happen in just one meeting. Um, we could add in there. Um, we believe this article should come back in next year's town meeting pending further analysis. Uh, which may go a long way to satisfy it because I th there is some incredibly good stuff in there and that is something that should be addressed. So it I'll let Leslie go and then I just want to go back to to where we were with the motion. Thank you. Leslie. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to point out to the board that um, it's my understanding that Gil Walker is presenting her article to the Finance Committee on Thursday. Oh. Um, she has submitted some additional materials to them, and she's planning on having some lighting experts at the meeting. So I think maybe instead of having her come back and present to you, um, if members want to tune in to the Finance Committee to get more information, I mean, it's not quite the same thing, but I, I think the presentation on Thursday will be more extensive than what you may get um, if you invite her to come to your meeting, just because of the experts that will be there. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, a quick question for you. Do you think that the article could be uh, broken up into uh, things that are adopted as a bylaw and things that are recommendations or guidelines? And if that were the case with some of the more technical or, or difficult parts, um, you know, would would that be worthwhile? Um, I think that's part of a much larger conversation. I mean, this this bylaw came in again as a citizen petition. It hasn't had, you know, a lot of time for review, and it's very complicated. So I think that may be something that can be achieved later, but I don't think that's something that can be broken out for town meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, Barry, back to you for a motion. So I make a motion at this point that we change it not to adopt, um, but somehow make an intonation in there that, that we believe it really should come back in next year's town meeting pending further analysis. I want to I want to encourage this. Okay. Well, to take no action, Barry. No. No, no, okay. no, 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 no. Let's let's okay. let's let's be let's be genuine to the public here at this point. I take no action does not always send a good. I'm learning it doesn't send a good signal. It's either yay or nay, and that so way people it, know what they're voting on. I, I appreciate right. what you're saying. If I can take a stab at it, um, you would like to make a motion not to adopt with the staff comments while revisions to the current bylaw should be considered. The article is proposed needs further study because it will require additional staff and add the comment. And we encourage this to be brought back at a future town meeting. Will that? Okay, I got a thumbs up from Barry. Do we have a second for that motion? Second. Thank you, Nat. Roll call vote. Seth Engelborg? Aye. Christy Ferrantella? Aye. Wendy Hudson? Aye. Steve Iverson? Aye. Kurt Johnson? Aye. Madam Nat Chair. I may lose you because I'm almost out of battery here. Even though it's plugged into the charger, for some reason it's not charging. So if I if I disappear, that's why. Okay, thank you, Bert. Uh, Nat Lowell? Aye. Barry Rector? Aye. John Trudell? Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. Thank you. And I think we are at the end of those articles. Uh, the next item on the agenda is Director of Planning's Annual Review. And where do we want to start on this? I know Megan has survey results. I don't know if we need to review them on screen. Um, Andrew, where do we want to begin? Thank you all for those of you who submitted reviews and uh, I appreciate all the comments and um, and your time and effort in, in the exercise. Um, you know, pleased to see that there's, uh, I guess, overall, 
satisfaction with um, the work that we do. Um, the overall uh, rating was 4.1, which um, is uh, similar to the prior years. Um, and again, thank you for that. Um, so uh, in accordance with the contract, um, the review, uh, satisfactory review is sort of um, the basis for an annual consideration for an annual increase. And um, I have uh, submitted a request for that, which I don't know if Megan has that particular form available or not. I do. Give me just a moment to bring it up because it was in some emails. Uh, while Megan is bringing that up, any uh, commissioners with comments for Andrew um, or on the annual review process? Nat? Yeah, just I just want to thank Megan for the, if it was her that made the survey monkey thing work so well, because this is, I think that was the best one we've done as far as how we've done it in the past. Um, so it was, it was well done and easy to, to comment on and not be redundant with the same kind of questions. Thank you. Dan. Um, I, I noted there wasn't really a place to note some of the accomplishments of the past year. Uh, and, and there were several, um, you know, hiring of the transportation planner, um, although that did not have the, as much of a happy ending as we had hoped. Um, we're certainly grateful for having one for almost a year. It made a huge difference, I think, in what we could get down for the town. Um, moving the open space plan forward, that was something that was languishing and has, has made great strides forward. So we appreciate that. Um, there are other things that are moving forward as well. Um, so I, I wanted to, to just point out that there were definitely uh, good accomplishments this year and also uh, hark back to the comments that we received from the public several meetings ago about the excellent functioning of the plus department. Um, just noting those as well. Okay, Barry, go that. Barry, go ahead. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, there's, there's really three tasks at hand here and when it comes time for a motion, I don't know if you would like me to deal with all three at once or whether you want to break these into their separate components. Um, think about that for a second, because the other thing I want to bring up is Andrew's raise. I, I'm not sure how to say this. I, I, I love what you put in, Andrew. Um, you deserve every penny, but then again, you deserve more as well, too, because I'm highly aware of how the town is also taking care of, of other employees who are, for lack of a better term, less senior than you. Uh, they're not in a director status. Um, for years on end, uh, you've, we've, you've had that opportunity to increase the pay structure in accordance with your peers, and you have always towed the line to, to go with what, what the general consensus is with the town. This, this year is just blowing my eyes open in a whole different way. Um, it's like Oprah Winfrey giving away cars. So I completely respect where you're at and I wanna do the right thing by you. And I think that if anyone has any questions, that 4.1% is, is, is at best, um, it's fine, it's fine. I'm just gonna leave it at that, thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, Megan does have the form up on the screen. Uh, any other comments or uh, notes from commissioners? We Are we voting on this tonight or is this just a subject? Uh, yes, I believe we're voting on it tonight um, after we have a motion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll make a motion to um, approve or endorse. Is the word approve or endorse correct? For this approve is, is approve yeah. what I thought I'll approve I'll the new contract second thank you Dave for the second further discussion if any roll call vote Seth Engelberg aye 
Steve Farantello? Aye. Lee Hudson? Aye. Steve Iverson? Aye. Kurt Johnson? Aye. Nat Lowell? Aye. Gary Rector? Aye. John Trudell? Aye. Mary Longacre, aye. Uh, Barry, you have additional motion? Yeah, I do at this point. So in doing so, we have approved the contract and the raise. Um, Andrew, do you also, would you also like a motion at this point to approve the results of the annual review? Or do you want to just, I, I, it's been a while since I've known when we've done this and it's fine, however you want to proceed with it. That's actually a motion to, um, you know, accept the review as submitted is fine. Okay. And is that, is that work? Yeah, Barry, do you want to make that motion? I'd love to then, please. Do we have a second? Okay. Thank you, Bert, for seconding. Uh, roll call vote, Seth Engelborg? Aye. Steve Rantella? Aye. Andy Hudson? Aye. Steve Iverson? Aye. Bert Johnson? Aye. Matt Lowell? Aye. Barry Rector? Aye. John Trudell? Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. Uh, Barry, do you have a further comment? Your hand is still raised. Oh, I'm sorry. Nope, all set. Thank you. Okay. Uh, other committee updates or reports? Anyone um, with an update? Yes, Barry. Yeah, from the Capital Program Committee. Um, first of all, thanks for allowing me to be part of it. It's been a fascinating experience, and I'm just enjoying myself. But there's a, we're we're coming to closure here with this year's process, um, and there's been some absolutely wonderful dialogue about certain capital uh, programs that do need to take place for the island itself. But having some background, just like with the Wall Winnet Bike Path, and being able to comment on that at that board was invaluable. So. Um, just to let you know, we're close. We'll be presenting to the Board of Selectmen on this Wednesday at 5.30. And then uh, we'll see where that takes us to from there. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for the work on that too. Other commissioners? Matt? I don't really have anything. I mean, I always like to kind of give a little steamship comment, but I think I gave enough earlier, but things are going pretty well. Um, forget about the reservation glitch. I mean, we, that doesn't count. Um, I'm talking about, you know, regular stuff. We, the Eagles back, um, we have a, we have a good back and forth relationship, um, with, uh, the high line and their scheduling right now. Um, the, the gray lady four should be back mid February that there's a reason it's not running right now. It's because there was a problem with Grey Lady 3 in December and it caused a scheduling problem. So it is definitely stressful for Nantucketers struggling to get back and forth with those boats that are sold out. But Grey Lady 4 should be back in, in you know, three weeks or so, I believe. Um, and the, the new boats, that's gonna be a little slower than what has been said, but it's it's a good thing. It's it's there's a lot of work involved in this, and to get it right, and they're all down in the same area in, in New Orleans area. So that will be uh, a great thing once that actually happens. And I'm hoping for we're hoping for some sometime around November of next year of this year for the first vessel to be completed but that's a guess so thank you other comments for commissioners All right, so megan would you send an email out to commissioners with the details of the finance committee meeting where they have gail walker scheduled for the lighting article uh, just so that we all have that information sure thank you uh, our next meeting, Thursday, February 23rd, that is before school vacation week. Um, hopefully that will not cause any issues, but that is a Thursday. Um, the difficulty there was the President's Day holiday on the Monday and not wanting to move a week later into the school vacation. So hopefully Thursday will work for everyone. Uh, we'll take a motion to adjourn if there's nothing else. Motion to adjourn, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Glad your battery Second. Made. Thank you, Nat.
Roll call vote, Seth Engelborg. Aye. Mr. Grantella? Aye. Andy Hudson? Aye. Kurt Johnson? Aye. Matt Lowell? Aye. Dave, did I miss you? Uh, aye. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Barry Rector? Aye. John Trudell? Aye. And Mary Long, here, aye. Good night, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Aye. All right. Thank you, Seth, for your comments. Patrick, thank you for everything you've done, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Thank, thank you, Bob. Patrick. There he is. Take care, Patrick. Good luck.